Brother George and brethren, thank you. Um, you know, what I started off with last night is what I feel this morning. And that is, first of all, it's an honor to be before you. And I thank you. And I'm humbled by the privilege that is extended here. Secondly, you know, the, the reason that we're able to see a little bit further, the farther we go, is because, as Brother Tom expressed it yesterday, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And that, those, those giants that have given us this background information that really tell us where we are, that we're at the time of the Lord's return. We've seen 1914 begin the eviction process of the Gentile times. And we're in this period of time that is still <clears throat> bringing down the powers of this old world. Now, we didn't focus too much last night on this part. And by the way, we're going to this morning review what we said yesterday. So if you say, oh, that's familiar, I hope so. Uh, it's a little bit of a review. And then we're going to extend from there. But, you know, after Elijah went through all these experiences, and it, to me, it was remarkable a few years ago when we realized that every one of the experiences of Elijah exactly connects to one of the six prophecies uh, of, of uh, five-time prophecies of the book of Daniel. Now, when I see that kind of connection, it really strengthens my faith that we are building on the right foundation, that we do understand the prophecies of Daniel the right way, that really has taken us to the 1335 days. And we talked a little bit about the Lord's return yesterday, that you would never... I think if you're trying to convince somebody of the Lord's return, you never start with a date. You have to start with the foundation of understanding what the Lord's return is all about, the manner of the Lord's return. And you know, when Brother Russell presents the subject in the volumes, that's what you have first. Volume one, you have the purpose, the object of his return. Volume two, you have the manner of his return. And once you understand that the manner of his return will be secret, unobserved, stealthy, known only to those that hear the knock of prophecy, open that door and sup with him, then you're ready for a date. Then you say, well, then it looks like we're we're in that time. We see Israel. We see the truth. We see the time of trouble. We must be in that time. And then a date, I think, can affirm for us. Now, after Elijah's coming to Mount Horeb after 40 days of journey that take you from 1874 to 1914. Then he saw a vision of the time of trouble. I think we've been in the time of trouble ever since 1914. And what I think the brethren didn't perceive before 1914 was that it was a process that would take considerable time. As a matter of fact, even after 1914, that wasn't quite digested. In volume three, in the foreword, you will find Brother Russell's expectation that he says we still believe that within a year or maybe two, well, let's be on the safe side, or three, he says, we expect the door to be closed, the church to be beyond the veil, and the harvest ended. Well, he, died, he wrote that in 1916. He died in 1916. Another year is 1917, 1918. Now, 1918 it was a day kind of projected, you know, in reprint 5950. Maybe, we don't know, maybe. That didn't work. 19, I think there was a point there, though. Maybe we'll get to that later. 1919. And ever since then, we've kind of been going on a year by year by year. And pretty soon, just like that frog in the, in the water, you know, you turn the heat up, it boils. It just never notices the change. Well, here we are over 100 years after 1914. We've got to reevaluate, re- see what's going on. And I think that's exactly what Brother Russell would have done had he lived here today. So what we have seen in the interim, now with retrospect, is that Elijah's vision was in three parts, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, and that these represent not brief moments, but rather decades-long unfolding of the time of trouble. The winds of war were uh, 1914 all the way through 1945. Now, even when World War I hit, everybody said, okay, that's our expectation, but... I doubt if anybody thought, well, it's going to come simmer down and then it's going to boil over again in World War II. But as a matter of fact, that's exactly what happened. Now, maybe we have time. We'll get through something in the book of Acts that I think even tells us there were going to be two world wars. Well, we wouldn't know that except in retrospect. And but then we can see the, the hints earlier. But the winds of war finished up in 1945. Then the breakup of the colonial powers has been in process since that time. 
And I think that breakup of colonial powers, well, it started real early. 1947, India got its independence from the British Empire. 1948, what was that nation? Let's see some. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Israel, 1948. That's one we're all excited about. And then after that, in the 60s, a lot of black Africa got their independence. In the 70s, uh, uh, a lot of Indochina, the French colonies began to break up. And finally, in 1989, you had the fall of the Soviet Union's grip over the countries of Eastern Europe. And I think that surprised me. Now, it didn't surprise everyone. I'm told a couple of brothers said, yeah, I kind of expected something. I sure didn't. I didn't know. So that was different. And it wasn't until after that, retrospectively, you began to look back and say, maybe that's the end of an era. Now, I remember sitting in an airport coming from a convention somewhere, listening to CNN at the airport, and hearing Iraq invaded Kuwait. And I thought, well, so what's this about? Is this a, a blip on the radar screen, or is this the beginning of a new problem? Now, I, you, have to, you have to go a few years and get a little perspective. But you know, that was the beginning, I think, of the fire. And I think that fire is the fire of Islamic insurgency. Now, we often say fire is anarchy, and boy, this is kind of an anarchy. You've got people blowing up things everywhere. You can't control it. It's a different form of anarchy than I might have guessed beforehand, but I think that's what it is. Since 1989, what was the first Gulf War? What was that, 19, early 90s, right? And then we got into Afghanistan, and then 9-11, and then the second, maybe I got the order mixed up there. The second Gulf War, the, quote, Arab Spring that turned out to be an Arab nightmare, and so here we are now. We've got the Syrian uh, war. You've, I, it just gets so... I need Len Grice here to explain the rest of that. You know, it just gets so complex. Now you've got Russia involved trying to theoretically bomb ISIS, but in fact they're going after other... Oh, it's just a mess. But you know, one thing that is stable throughout it, the interests of Israel are being accentuated. Now there's a prophecy in Isaiah 17.1. Paul, did you have a, a comment? Okay, there's a prophecy in Isaiah 17.1 that I think might be of interest in the current, the current situation. Now, this is a little bit of a tangent. Okay, I agree. But I want to get to the fact that there are decades of experience that we have to go through. Isaiah 17.1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. It shall be a ruinous heap. I read that years ago, and I thought, I wonder if Israel is going to go over and bomb them because of some other hostility. But it looks like... Syria, is, Damascus is collapsing under the weight of its own internal problems. As a matter of fact, I've seen aerial photographs, you know, just on the Internet. I haven't looked too carefully, but it shows the, the environs of Damascus, and then it shows common day. It's all bombed out. I mean, it's just disaster. It's, it's happened in a completely different way than I expected. Now look at Isaiah 19.1, the burden of Egypt. Uh, the, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud shall come into Egypt, be, uh, uh, verse 2, I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians. And that's how the Egyptian situation has kind of been nullified. You had Morsi coming to power, and you had, through a revolution, and then he's out, and now you've got a stable force. So the Egyptians are involved in their own internal struggle. And I think this is the way the Lord has taken care of that front. I happen to notice, by the way, you look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, Egypt is not mentioned as a final protagonist maybe because they're absorbed in their own problems. So what all, everything that's going on in the Arab world seems to me to be working in sync with Israel having time to develop and prosper. Now, what's going to happen with the Iran situation? Oh, well, stay tuned, you know? We're just interesting to see how things are going to work. Now, here's something that we didn't show yesterday, and that is there's a certain symmetry between observing what we have and, with the prophetic days of Daniel in the past 1799 is the date we all think was the end of the 1260 years. I think that's right. There, until the time when Miller expected the Lord to return, 1843, at the end of the 2300 years, was 44 years. To the time he actually returned was another 31 years to 1874. And there you have Elijah take going 40 days to Mount Horeb. That's the 40 years of the early work of the harvest. And that takes you to the time of trouble in 1914. And now from here, that's the last time prophecy we've got in the book of Daniel, the time of trouble. So here, we don't have these dates marked prophetically. We just see them by observation. The wind phase of Elijah ended in 1945. That's when World War II stopped. And then the breakup of the colonial powers 
If that terminated in 1989, if that climax then with it followed the Soviet Union's grip over Eastern Europe, that's another 44. Oh, what do I got here? Yeah, yeah, 44. See, you see the symmetry. And so it's this kind of symmetry that tells us, I think maybe we're on the right track of understanding what God's prophetic word is telling us. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could project one more here? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, not from this chart, but from other, other kinds of evidences. But taking away from the final climax, just looking at this, I think it's encouraging. That's all I can say. It's encouraging that we're on the right path. Paul? of the wind, earthquake, and fire is the bringing Jews back to the land. Without the wind, there would be no nation of Israel. Without the earthquake, all those Russian Jews wouldn't have gotten out. And now with the fire that's not just in the Middle East, but, you know, in France and all around the world, it's bringing Jews back to the land. So that's, that's one of the major impacts of the wind, earthquake, and fire. Well, that's an excellent observation. I actually hadn't looked at that side of the coin, but I think you're right. That's a very good point. So on one hand, it's breaking up the old powers, preparing for the kingdom. On the other hand, it's, it's preparing Israel to be augmented and be ready to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. I would have missed that, that point. And by the way, I want to accentuate, this is not meant to be just a monologue. This is meant to be interactive. So please take advantage of that, uh, Brother Tom. <clears throat> On the right side of that chart, 1914, 1945, you say is the wind. Yeah. And then 45 to 89, you say is the earthquake. Yeah. So you've got works in those periods of time. Are there parallel works on the left side that would correspond to that? Um, that's a good question. I haven't thought that deeply. I need somebody like you to look at that with that question and tell me the answer. No, I need you to give me the answer. I can ask the question. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, but that's a very good question. Uh, you know, sometimes you see something like this, and you say, whoa, look at that, and uh, I'm, I'm happy, and I don't go farther. So, but that's a, that's, we could take it farther and probe for that. That's a very good question. Um, okay, now to review again what we have talked about from yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> we went from there to the basic uh, understanding of the chronology on slide number one, slide one. And this is just review now, because we spent some time on this. The first three of those periods of time in the chronology is not new to anybody. And not even the fourth isn't new to anybody, really. It's just disputed. But the first three are right there in volume two, also in Clark's commentary and also McClintock and Strong's, anywhere you want to look, you can get those three. Now, there are some reasons to dispute this, but the brethren don't seem to dispute it. And while I had some questions, I don't dispute it because I resolved those questions. So those first three are very familiar to you. This is right from 1 Kings 6 1. Now, that is disputed. We'll talk about that later on. But what I want to do is just tell you how we get to this concept of chronology. And I want, as we emphasized yesterday, this isn't something I dreamed up. This is something that is right from the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, I often accentuate the Hebrew Old Testament because the Septuagint changes all the figures. And it t changes a lot of figures. By the way, how long did Solomon reign? Forty years? Septuagint says it was double that, 80 years. You see, that's the kind of thing. It's changing figures to expand everything. Well, not everything. Sometimes it abbreviates but it just changes figures. So I emphasize the Hebrew Old Testament. And we'll talk about 1 Kings 6 one later on, perhaps this afternoon. And then we found out that the even so, so prolific a, a testimony as the NIV gives us this date of 966 B.C. for Solomon's temple being founded as the end of 1 Kings 6 one. So with that 2,992 years from Adam to the temple... That means that Adam was created in 3958. Now, that's the date I use all the time. And that means 6,000 years ends in 2043. There's nothing mysterious about those. It's very straightforward. It depends upon this date and that text. That's what it depends upon. Now, those are in dispute. So we have to talk about that. We're going to backfill that information later. But I, what I find is if I start with a technical analysis of exactly why I think these are right, you know, first of all, the eyes begin to glaze over. Okay, even, you know, I know that. That's just what happens. And secondly, the brethren don't come away with a sense of, well, so what does this mean? 
you almost kind of have to start there and say this is where it's going before you're really prepared to hear all the details to see how solid a foundation there is for this conclusion. Now, last night, we did talk about the fact... See what's coming up next. Oh, yeah, I'll get there. We did talk about the fact that when Brother Miller put together his prophetic scenario, he had all the time prophecies. We had the 1260 ending in 1799, all the rest of them ending in 1843. And so... He found a way to make 6,000 years end there. And that when Brother Nelson Barber updated all that in a good way, he also, thinking that the Lord would return then in 1874, or that he had rather, he found a way to get 6,000 years approximately into sync with that. I say approximately, because, you know, it's a couple of years difference. Now, Jeff knows more about this than I do, but when I look at Bowen's chronology from native sources, I don't even see it as close as that. I think Barber adjusted a little bit. Am I right, Jeff? I brought the documentation with me. Uh, If anyone wants to look at it, I have it in a bag here. But from what I can gather and what you can see, that in... uh, it's not even Bowen's chronology, first of all. Yeah. Eliot in Hori Apocalyptica, it was a four-volume revelation commentary in the 1840s. He's looking at another chronology by a gentleman named Henry Fines Clinton. Clinton ended in the 6,000 years in 1862, about 10 that's, years. Different. That's what I thought, more like a 10-year right. difference, yeah. But what Eliot does have is the destruction of the temple is 587. Yeah. And he doesn't count the 70 years as a desolation, it's counted as a captivity to all the other nations around. Um, so you modify by that, it gets right. closer. Okay, good. And so when Barbara wanna... picks it up, Barbara changes that to desolation. Okay. And he says, this has got to be when the temple was destroyed, and he moves the temple destruction date. All right. He even specifically says at Eliot in the book that 606 was the accession year of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Thank you. I want to look more at that and get a little clearer in my mind. But here's the point I want to make from this. In both cases with what Brother Miller did and with what Brother Barber did. What they did was something very logical. I would have done the same thing if I was in their shoes at that time. They found that the time prophecies pointed them to one spot, and so they looked for a way to get 6,000 years ending about harmonious with what the time prophecies seemed to say. In other words, it was not from building up the count of years from Adam in the most innately cogent way, and then saying, look, look where that takes us. It was the reverse. It was kind of reverse engineered. It was saying, the time prophecies tell us about here. Let's see if we can find a chronology that kind of matches similar. Now, that's not bad. Like I say, I would have done the same thing, because you do like to find harmony. And if there's not harmony in the divine plan, where are we going to, you know, it's going to be there. So you would look to find harmony. But now, in retrospect, if we see causes where we have to we're forced, I think, by evidence, scripture and otherwise, to see that there's uh, some adjustments to make in chronology and that, in fact, this puts 6,000 years to the end of the harvest rather than the beginning, then that's something we hadn't considered. By, see, we hadn't considered. I mean, in our prophetic writings going back to Brother Miller all the way forward, that idea has not been cogently examined, at least not in writing, you know, with specific evidence, as far as I can see. But that seems to be where we're headed. Now, we, we, this, if you, if you don't remember anything else from this weekend, remember this. (laughs) This, to me, is remarkable. That finding the history of time from Adam forward, using what is currently the best accepted testimony of the scriptures all the way back to Solomon, and then just adding the Hebrew Old Testament, spontaneously, this arises, and no other way. This requires exactly the chronology that we're talking about. All of a sudden, you find that the 40 years of Jeremiah's ministry, which is marked in Scripture, in Jeremiah, the first chapter, from the 13th year of Josiah until the carrying away of Israel captive under Zedekiah, 40 years. When you position it here in that 2,500-year period, Spontaneously, it generates in this period, 1874 to 1914. Dates that we all know and are endeared to and are meaningful. 
the Lord's return, the time of trouble, and the testimony of the seventh messenger for 40 years. Jeremiah didn't die here. Brother Russell didn't die here. But these 40 years are parallel together. Now, when Brother Tom mentioned, and he, he told me, he showed me today the evidence that I knew what he, said, what he said about Jeremiah. Yeah, I heard it years ago. And, you know, sometimes when you hear a thought, you think, hmm, interesting, you've got to get back to that. But then later, when you have a place to put it, then you say, oh, my goodness, that, that fits remarkably. So that, the very fact that Tom, um, I think, expressed that the man with the writer's inkhorn literally in the Ezekiel's day was Jeremiah, but prophetically in our day is Pastor Russell. That connects this diagram even more solidly. Brother Peter. This right here? That's 458, and we'll get to that in the next slide. Next slide. That's very good. So... Uh, but ir- irrespective of what date it was, once, once you use that 966 plus the Hebrew Old Testament, this comes out of it. Now, that's remarkable. How, did, how is it that, that, the old, that the testimonies of other people who know nothing about Pastor Russell or Jeremiah's connection suddenly produce this? So the point is that when you follow the facts where I think they lead, suddenly things become more clear, more precise, more enhancing to the ministry of Pastor Russell. Now here's the various pieces along the way that parallel Jeremiah with Pastor Russell. We talked about those yesterday. There's even another one I could have added, but that's, that's adequate for now. And here we have spontaneously generated out of this history of time from Solomon's temple back to Adam. Spontaneously generated is also this. Now, the previous slide talked about Pastor Russell and our day in the harvest. Pastor Russell is only, of course, one of those star messengers in the hand of our Lord Jesus. His ministry is important to us simply because he was in the hand of Jesus, who was feeding us present truth at the end of the age. Here is a testimony directly about Jesus himself. Now, Brother Peter, you asked about the middle date. There's the middle date. I actually remember when I, when I was, saw that, it was calculator very much like this but its predecessor and I was late at night and I was in bed thinking about these things and I said well what would be the midpoint I could hardly believe it I it was because I knew what that date was 458 BC that's the date that begins Ezra's service now you know that brother Miller when he considered the 40 uh, 70 weeks of prophecy brother Miller thought it started with Ezra if you look at at uh, at Isaac Newton and his writings, he believed that began with Ezra. A lot of other Christian writers thought it began with Nehemiah. Now, today we'll have time maybe later on to talk about the backfill of the information here. Today, I think we can resolve this prophecy only fits one way. Wow, what a blatant statement. What a bold claim. It only fits one way, but I think that that actually is accurate. It only fits to start with Ezra's return and his the decree to uh, inquire for the status of Judah and Jerusalem. That's almost an exact quote from the, from the um, uh, decree of Artaxerxes. And so he went back to inquire about Jerusalem. Seventy weeks later, Jesus would die on the cross. Right in the middle of 7,000 years begins that count of years. Habakkuk 2 is at verse 6. In the midst of the years, in wrath, remember mercy. And right in the midst of the years, While wrath of God is poured out upon all flesh, he remembers mercy, counts the years to redemption, the first age of redemption, the second age of redemption. It all begins right there. Those two slides, they're stunning. Those two points are stunning. I didn't make this up. They just come when you get the right dates, the dates that we'll talk about later in the afternoon, the foundation for them. So these two slides, like I say, if you don't remember anything else, remember those two. (laughs) Pastor Russell and our Lord Jesus spontaneously arise as precious markers from the facts as we have them. Now, we have uh, also, let's see, what do we come up next here? Yeah, then we talked about the flood. I don't want to get to that quite yet. Let's go to slide number 27, and this is from Pastor Russell. Now, uh, Brother Jeff, uh, not uh, Brother Stefan, excuse me. Uh, I'm glad for people that think carefully and precisely. He showed me this is a small misquote. He's right. Uh, but Jeff, uh, uh, Stefan, what does it say? Uh, not until the jewels are complete, but till all the jewels are gathered, something like that. 
Yeah, same thought, but I, I, I didn't use the right word here. But it's clear when you look at reprint 2739, where Brother Russell was asked directly about this question, he said, there's some things that we are obscure here because it has too early for the Lord to tell us. But secondly, this we know, Revelation 20, verse 4, which he quotes verbatim, that cannot happen until all the jewels are complete. And we have the companion to this, and that's this slide, which we talked about quite a bit yesterday. As he wrestled with this a few years later, he realized that 6,000 years mean 1,000 years here, but the 2520 parallels mean 1,000 years here. He thought that's the answer. That's Revelation 20, verse 4. And uh, this was a preliminary overlapping period of some sort. As we know, this didn't work because the 1,000 years didn't begin in 1914. But the concept suggests that sixth, the seventh millennium, the 1,000 the years of Christ's reign, rather, of, as priest, the priestly reign, would be in the future, after the church is complete. Now, I want to make this point again. I know this is old hat. I knew about these things before I, had, I was on board, before I was on board. And some people ask me, well, what did you think about this before? Uh, very simple. I thought Pastor Russell was wrong. And now I think Pastor Russell was right. Now, there were things clarified in the interim. That helps quite a bit. But that's where it stands. So I really think that this is telling us what Pastor Russell thought. Under question, directly about the issue when does Revelation 20 happen? That's why there has been a divide in the truth movement for the last 50 years on this question. Because from our heritage, we have two opinions that haven't been reconciled for a long time. Now, right in this room, we have elders that have wrestled over this and given discourses on it. Brother George has studied this more copiously than I have. One thing I want to do is go back through his old notes. And what was it, 185 times where Brother Russell speaks about the issue uh, in passing, but these are two out of those that are extremely explicit that tell us exactly what he did believe about Revelation 20, verse 4. I now think he was right. I, I formerly thought that maybe he just mis- wasn't quite on the ball. Uh, we didn't go there. Let's see, where are we? Let's go back to the flood. That would be uh, 26? No, 7, 7, 7. No, no, no. <clears throat> Is that uh, we, we want seven? Thank you, thank you. Okay, there's the flood episode, and again, this is repeat, but it, 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 it's so straightforward. It's right there. You know, I think I think it's it's just so clear. Forty days takes you to the time of trouble for the Jewish age. The flood experience started with Jesus in 33 A.D. when you get into the ark. At the end of the age, you come aground. You're at the end period, but you're before the curse is dried. Well, the end of the age before the curse is dried would be the Lord's return. 74 days later, taking to 1948, you see the top of the mountains out in the distance. That's a remarkable interplay. Just exactly what we have seen to tell us we are on track. The kingdom is coming. We see visibly tangible evidence on the kingdoms of this world. A new kingdom spawned in 1948. Wasn't there before, except thousands of years ago. It's restored now. And that's going to be the kingdom by which God blesses all the families of the earth. The waters still prevail, though, until finally they throw off the covering of the ark. They see the ground dry. And it's exactly to the very day at the end of six centuries of the calendar that they were then dating things in. I think that tells us the 6,000 years take us to the close of the harvest. That is, like George said in his introduction, the whole resolution of all the issues. 6,000 years takes you not to the beginning of the harvest, but to the close of the harvest. Something William Miller could never entertain because he never knew that there was a harvest of period of time after the Lord returned. That Lord would return and wrap everything up. Now, Brother Barber did know that, but he's still working with the assumptions of of Brother Miller. So he went looking for 6,000 years to take you to the beginning of the period. Now, in retrospect, if 6,000 years takes you to the close everything begins to iron out. Pastor Russell is marked in that symmetry. Our Lord Jesus and his sacrifice is marked. This all makes sense. Oh, it just, it just fits. Now, we took a, a, a next step forward 
And we suggested, as two brethren suggested to me, not independent with me, that if, in fact, the calendar they were using does require, like the calendars of antiquity we know did, it's a matter of record, that before the New Year's Day they added five days to make the 365, then that tells you that actually that kingdom turns out to be at 2043. To verify this count, we suggested the total days that they were in the ark was 127, 127, and 127. Total 381. So you have three stories in the ark, three periods of time in the divine plan when the Holy Spirit works, three doves that were sent out, you have three courts in the floor plan of the ark, and you have three lifespans of Sarah, the Abrahamic covenant, for the ancient worthies, for the church, for the world of mankind. It's a very tidy package. This is all review still. So that's why we're going a little bit quick. Okay. Um, I think that's the end of our review. So now we're ready for fresh material. Any questions before we go on? Paul? Uh, the the Jewish calendar, um, you know, which begins in September and goes Tishri, into... Tishri for yeah, September, t- October. So September, October. So do they go by a 30-day and add? They do not. That? They the don't? Jewish calendar today is a lunar calendar. It's 29 or 30. 29 or 30. And they got rules to determine how to make it. They add an extra month every few years. I see. I, I think it's like uh, seven times out of every 19 years, they add an extra month. So, now, today, they don't look at the moon to determine the next month. They actually have it mathematically figured out ever since the last 2,000 years or so. But in former days, presumably, they looked at the moon. So they put their 6,000 years a couple hundred years from now. Yeah. So they're in like the year 5776, I think, now. Yeah, yeah they're off so quite a bit. Is there a reason why they're off yeah, so much? They, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't it, you know, today we dispute whether the fall of Zedekiah was, what, 606 or 587? They don't dispute. They, they have it much earlier, m- much closer to us, much closer. They are like 80 years off in the history of the Persian Empire. They really didn't understand their whole history. And that's, that's remarkable. you think everybody should, would. They would, but they really didn't. The records of antiquity were not well preserved. Uh, their temple was burned by the Romans, uh, by, the, uh, by the Babylonians. They lost a lot. And I could talk more about that, but that's, that's the essence. They really are lost when it comes to that. Most rabbis and Jews today know that they're not really right. <laughs> but, you know, our calendar, what we have today, we have A.D. era, but we know Jesus was really born in 2 B.C., so we don't really dispute that, right? We just use the calendar. That's what they do, too. Okay, so now we're going to go on to... Uh, is there any other comments? Okay, we're going to go on to another feature. Now, this is a technical feature, so we're going to take it a little slow. It's slide number 10. But what we observe is if we have the right count of years, if that's true, then... Shouldn't we go back and look at it and look at when things occurred in the history of the world as it actually unfolded? And if you do, could you possibly find things of interest that would align the the events of history, of scriptural history, in some meaningful order rather than just randomly distributed events that happened every so often? Is there some pattern, some order some plan behind the appearance of notable events in Scripture. Well, you know, I didn't know that there would be. I didn't even really go looking. I just was interested to know, well, how far between things, how many years between things had happened. And so you begin to investigate, and this begins to pop out at you. This is very simplistic, maybe so simplistic you think, well, I don't know if there's a point to it. But it turns out that if you... It, are you in Egypt? And there's the Exodus. And according to what we're suggesting, which isn't our dates, but they are the dates I, I think are right, the Exodus would be at 1445 B.C. Now, if you want to go on the Internet and check to see if anybody else in the world has that opinion, just Google 1445 B.C. and Exodus, and you'll see voluminous numbers of hits. This is a well-accepted date by those who believe the Bible. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, you may not even believe the Exodus happened, let alone a good date for it. But if you believe the Bible and you look at Kings and Chronicles and the Hebrew Old Testament, you'll find a lot of people agree with this, not just my date. I didn't invent that. I did, however, pour over it for years to satisfy myself that it is correct. If that's true, 
Then, if you go forward, uh, if you go back to the flood, then there would be 858 years back to the flood. And if you go forward a similar period of time, you'll find it takes you to the fall of Zedekiah in 587. Now, what's the point? I don't know. Maybe it's just fortuitous. Maybe there's nothing to this. Well, let's just inquire. But at least we observe this. The symmetry catches my attention. Well, what could 858 be all about? And secondly, this is just a random chance. But then you observe. When the exodus occurred, and we talked about that a little yesterday, that was at the death of the firstborn of Egypt. That synchronizes with the seventh plague in Revelation, Armageddon. That's at the end of the harvest. The last plague, the death of the firstborn, is the end of the harvest. Well, what is the flood all about? That's a picture of the sweeping away of the old world of the end of the harvest. Do you remember Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man? In the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Anything wrong with that? Nothing. That's just normal human conduct, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, and knew not until the flood came and swept them all away. Then they knew. Then they knew that was divine judgment. That's where we are today. We're in the days of the Son of Man. Life is going on about people. We see the changes. They see the changes, but they don't know what it means. But they're just going on about their daily life until finally the end of the harvest and the flood sweeps them away. So here's the point. The flood sweeping them away is a marker for the end of the harvest in an overall big sense. So at least we notice that this symmetry marks two things that mean the same thing. They both point to the end of the harvest. What about the fall of Zedekiah? Yes, Your prophecies in Jeremiah that are picked up in Revelation, they show that old, nominal, debased, natural Israel is a symbol of nominal, spiritual Israel in Revelation. And the fall of one is a picture of the fall of the other. And that crescendo comes with Armageddon. So here's what we observe. First, it engages our attention that there's a symmetry. Okay, maybe that's meaningful, maybe it's not. But here's point number two. That is, all three events marked by that symmetry all have a common theme. They all talk about the end of the harvest. Now, we've got two things linked together here. Maybe there's meaning here. Maybe there's not. So we keep inquiring, go a little further. And we find out that if we go 655 years further to the next judgment of Israel, you remember Jesus was baptized in what year? 29, and for 40 years they had probation. Before the year 69, in which their probation was up, that's the last year they could keep the atonement offerings in the temple. After that, it would be destroyed. So this takes you to 69, the end of the 40 years of their probation. This is the next time the temple is going to be removed by the Romans instead of the Babylonians, 655 years later. Take that and project that backward here, And it takes you exactly to the end of Adam's thousand-year day. Now, Adam's thousand-year day, that little period of the curse, is kind of emblematic of the 6,000 years of sin and death that closed with the end of the harvest. So, prophetically, well, Matthew 24 says that is a picture of Armageddon. And that 1,000 years in which Adam died is a little picture of the 6,000 years of the curse that end according to the perspective we have here, at the end of the harvest. So now we have not three things that all have a common theme, but five things that all have a common theme to the end of the harvest. Now, here's where it fits into the larger context. There's a thousand-year day of Adam. There's a symmetry of these five episodes. And there's the thousand-year day of Christ, beginning, as we think, in 2043. There's a big gap here of 1,974 years. Now, as we look at all of this, we think, okay, we've got a symmetry. We've got some connected events. If that symmetry is meaningful, that means that these are the right dates, 1445, 587, 69, 2303, 
uh, be uh, 2958. Okay, I didn't put all the dates here, but the point is, those dates would be correct. If this symmetry is meaningful, then the dates underlying them must be right. So is this meaningful? That's the question. Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> okay. Now here's another set of symmetry that we just notice. And that is, this happened years ago. Somebody put a question in our question box in San Diego. And they said, you know, I noticed that Babylon fell in 539 B.C., and we say that spiritual Babylon begins in 539 A.D. Is there any point to this, or is that just a coincidence? And I remember what I thought. No, that's, it's a coincidence of date numbers, that's all. But as I thought about it more, I thought, no, wait a minute. <clears throat> Actually, the 70 years for Babylon really ended in 540 B.C., and then 539 years later would take you to 1 B.C., 539 years later would take you to 539 A.D. So there is a symmetry here, but I don't know about this, 1 B.C., whatever happened? Well, hold that thought, that question in abeyance for just a moment. But then we notice this, 1335 years later take you to the Second Advent. 1335 years earlier take you to the Abrahamic Covenant, precisely to the year. So we've got another double symmetry. Is this meaningful or is this just fortuitous? Well, then we observe a few things. In Malachi, when it talks about the return of Christ, it talks about the messenger of the covenant, which by all accounts is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, I could take some time to demonstrate that, but that is by far and away the general conclusion of brethren, that when Malachi says the messenger of the covenant, he means the Abrahamic covenant. And I can even quote a passage in Luke that I think supports that. But here's the point. At the return of Christ, that is when the messenger of the Abrahamic covenant appears to secure all the blessings that covenant promised. And that's the time when we come out of Babylon that we went into spiritually in 539. So you have Babylon here, Babylon here, the Abrahamic covenant pointing to the second advent, the second advent. Egypt, you know, is a picture of Christendom as well. The ten plagues smote Egypt. That's the smiting of Christendom. There's a scripture also in Revelation 11 that uh, talks about where the two witnesses were slain, which spiritually is Sodom and Egypt. Now, we saw Sodom yesterday. That's where Lot comes out of. That's Christendom. Here, Egypt is a picture of Christendom as well. So <clears throat> all of these things are thematically related, thematic to the second advent, when we come out of Babylon that we went into. And that we, again, we have a symmetry. The difference between this symmetry and this one is that this one takes you to the kingdom, this one takes you to the return of Christ. This takes you to the beginning of the harvest, this one takes you to the end of the harvest. Now, that's a lot of facts and figures just to throw up. Now, it's a pretty diagram, but, you know. But is, it, is, is, this, is, this, is this right? Is this really telling us we're on the right path? Well, I think it bears further investigation. I think it makes sense. But let's just see. Are there connections between them? It turns out that there are a variety of connections between these that suggest that this is part of a divine design. Now, here's the first one. You see the center of this symmetry? The exodus from Egypt. The center of this symmetry? Jesus, when he left Egypt. Now, that was just, before Herod, just after Herod died. Herod died in 1 BC in January Oh, I don't know, maybe the calendar put it slightly near February, I'm not sure. And after that, the angel appeared and says, you go back now. So Jesus came out of Egypt in 1 B.C. Israel came out of Egypt in 1445 B.C. Now, can somebody look for us in the text of Scripture, Hosea 11, verse 1. And that text unifies both of these events. Hosea 11, 1 is a prophecy about Jesus. It's also a comment about Israel. So this is the first connection between these two. Do you have it? Sure. Who, who's that? Peter. Peter. Oh, Peter, would you read that for us? Hosea 11. One. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Peter. I didn't mean to pass you by. Brother Paul, you want to read that for us? 
When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, when Hosea penned those words, he's, it's all past tense. It's all in the past. It's all talking about when the son of God, collectively the nation of Israel, was called out of Egypt. Now, Ezekiel, when he talks about Israel, talks about them being birthed then. You know, that's, that's the way he considers it. And, but his son was called out of Egypt, talks about the Exodus. But you all know that that text in Hosea 11.1 1 is also used by Matthew as a prophecy of the time when Jesus came out of Egypt. Jesus going back to Egypt and then coming out was a little kind of fulfillment in the Son of God of what happened to the other Son of God, Israel, who went into Egypt and then later came back out of Egypt. Now, that's what happens to us, too. We're all in this sojourn of Egypt, and at the Exodus, pictures the tenth plague, the end of the harvest, when we all come out of Egypt, as it were. So there's deep meaning here. But here's the first connection between these two patterns of symmetry. The center point of each one is predicated on the very same text of Scripture. Okay, now we're getting enough connections that we start talking about that expression that we have in our culture today, intelligent design rather than random events. We're talking about intelligent design, and that tells us the underlying facts seem in order. That's one thing that connects the two. Here's another. You see these random periods of time, 1335, 539, 655, 858. Let's focus on this one just for now. Here is my suggestion that there is meaning in those numbers. Now, when we go here, <clears throat> we, that's right in Scripture, 1335. That, that's right from Scripture. That's how we get it. So there's no point, no, no question that that number of years is meaningful. Daniel 1212 12 says it point blank. 539, pertaining to our Lord Jesus. Well, I didn't always know this, but it seems simple. But you know what 539 is? Seven times 77. Uh, there's, there's, there's numerically some interest to that number. It's not just random. So if it's talking about our Lord Jesus coming out of Egypt, as it were, well, there's a point to this that ties you into Jesus, the perfect one, seven. So I think there's, there's a point to the number. But now I want to deal with these other two numbers, which are much less known to us. I mean, did you ever think of 858 or 655 before you came in the room today? I, possibly, but I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. Um, there's some reason you might have, but it's, it's remote. You know, I doubt that you did. So here's what those numbers break down to be. Now, I think that those numbers are brief ways of taking you to the end of the harvest. Now, let's see if you think this is credible. Or not. You know, before we go too far, Peter, you did have a question, and I, I could talk for another hour and pass you by, so let me, let me ask you what it was. I think you'd rather need a break from this train of thought anyway for a moment. Go ahead. You did? Okay, okay. Then you tell me sometime. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Peter. I was Okay. <laughs> Credit to my calculator. <laughs> Can, can I quote you on that? <laughs> Peter, you're, you're a dear saint. You're a dear precious soul. Thank you. Okay. So what is, why the number 858? Is it meaningful or is it just a number that happened to be used in the symmetry? Well, here's my opinion. I think 858 has meaning because it's 845 Plus 13. Okay, never heard of that before. So what's the point behind that? I think these are brief ways of telling us something about longer time periods in God's plan. Now let's think about this for a moment. 13. Why would 13 be meaningful? Now, I have often said, and I've said it for years, 13 is the number for the ransom. That's the perfect one, Jesus, who took our sins on his shoulders Seven, that's six. Seven and six is 13. Now, here's a picture, not in numbers, but the same concept. You remember that Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, 
And by lifted up, he didn't mean to the right hand of God. He meant lifted up three or four feet on the cross of Calvary. When he said that, everybody knew what he meant because they said, I thought Messiah would live forever because they knew what he was talking about, his death. So ever since I was a boy, this seemed very odd to me. Why is Jesus unambiguously represented by a serpent on a pole? That always seemed weird to me. But I think it makes perfect sense of a figure of the ransom. It was made of copper. Copper is a picture of perfect humanity or justified humanity. One of those is used in the tabernacle that way. I think the point here is that Jesus was the perfect man on whom our sins were laid as our sin bearer. And that's the combination that is the ransom, the perfect one who takes our sins, the seven and the six. That's why 13 is a picture of the ransom. Now, yesterday we read in 1 Kings 7, verse 1, that after Solomon constructed his temple, for seven years it took to build that temple, that's constructing the church as the vehicle for drawing people back to God in the millennium. Seven stages of the church, seven years for the temple, that makes perfect sense. That's a view we've had for a long time we collectively in our fellowship have had for a long time. But 1 Kings 7.1 says, then he built a house to his own glory and it took him 13 years. What does that all about? I think it's the other side of the coin. It's still the church being built up during the gospel age. But now instead of showing it as the vehicle for drawing the world back to God, that's good for a thousand years. What happens after that? For the ages of eternity. Well, the church will be the agent of glory for our Lord Jesus forever. This is something God has done for Jesus to build up a house of of glory for him, for what he did for the plan of God to give up his life as our ransom. It's going to redeem the whole world. And beyond that, it's going to be used as a source for bringing the church into being 13 years, a picture of the gospel age, the age of redemption, that's going to be a glory to Jesus forever, well beyond the thousand years. So there's two dimensions to the call of the church. Seven is the gospel age number for the seven stages. Thirteen, the gospel age number for the redemption, the first age of redemption. And after that, he builds a house for the forest, for the people, made of wood. That's the kingdom on earth. It measures the same dimensions as the court of the tabernacle because that's where the people will be forever and ever. So that 13 is another way of saying gospel age, just like the number seven is, just a little different dimension, another age of redemption. So how long is the harvest? If we're on the right track, you tell me, how many years from 1874 until 2043? How many years is that? Is it a meaningful number or an arbitrary number? How long is that period? Donna's got her calculator at hand. We'll wait for the... Is that right? Okay. We'll wait for the answer with a drum roll, please. She has an independent way of knowing. The answer is... Yeah, a lot of rumors going around. 169. 169, that's it. Now, when I saw that number, I thought, oh, okay. (laughs) It's not like 170, a nice round number or something, you know. It's 169, but it is what it is. So what what meaning does that number have? David, do you have a comment on that? 13 squared. 13 squared. So now I say, okay. There is meaning to this. 13 times 13. 13 is the number of the ransom. So how appropriate to end off the gospel age, the first age of redemption, which is pictured by the number 13, but with 13 13s, 169 years. And I say, okay, that's fitting. Now, you know, there's no way I would try to prove 2043 by showing 169, right? Don't get the cart before the horse. But if all of the other facts point this way, then I say, is there a meaning to that number? And I think there is. I think that is the capstone of the gospel age, the harvest of the gospel age, not 13 only, but 13 times 13. 
kind of cap off this first stage of redemption. Now, do we see that anywhere else? Yeah, you see it right back here. That thousand-year period, the thousand years of Adam, there was a very faithful man of God that lived during that time, the seventh from Adam, that died 13 years before that thousand year ended. Who do I have in mind? Enoch, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, died at 365 years of age, just as the church, a picture of the church that is, that is, uh, it will shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And he died 13 years before the end of Adam's thousand year day. What is this telling us in symbol, in picture? I think it's telling us that that thousand years is a little glimpse of the 6,000 years of the curse, and the Enoch class is taken. Enoch represents those who died before the harvest, and when the Lord returns, they're taken quietly, secretly, unobserved. Not like Elijah, taken at the end of the harvest in great fanfare with great expectation. The sleeping saints were raised after the Lord's return. That's 13 years before the close of the curse of sin and death. A little way of saying that that's the beginning of the harvest 13 times 13 years before the close. In other words, just like 1,000 here is a little way of testifying to the whole period of the curse, so that 13 years before the end is a little way of representing the length of the harvest of 13 times 13. Now, it's not the only time that you see this. You see this Egypt right here, the Exodus, from Adam until then is like 2,500 years. Well, not exactly. That would be a stunning point if it was, nice even number. But it's not exactly. You have to add 13 more years to get to the Exodus because that's picturing the climax of the church going beyond the veil at the end of a 13-year period. Now, if you want to see where 13 is used again, you could look in the book of Nehemiah. And you'll find that when Ezra... Well, let's go there. Now, I think we're, running, we're butting up against my time, I know. We'll have to continue this later. But in Nehemiah... Let's see, to find the passage. This is chapter 8. Chapter 8. Even though it's in the book of Nehemiah, it's talking about Ezra at a time when Ezra and Nehemiah were both serving together at the same time. Who is the superior, Ezra or Nehemiah? Who's greater in authority between the two? That may be a hard question. Maybe a hard question. Nehemiah. He's the governor. Ezra is subject to him. Now, I believe Ezra is a little picture of Pastor Russell and that Nehemiah What was his job for the king? He was a cupbearer. Well, that cupbearer is a picture of our Lord Jesus that has the wine of redemption. I think Nehemiah is a picture of our Lord Jesus. I think this all takes place at the return of Christ and that Ezra represents the one that is teaching the people and ministering to their spiritual needs under Nehemiah. So it turns out that Nehemiah wanted Ezra to read the law in the ears of the people. So he did. In Nehemiah 8 verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of, of what? Wood. Now, wood, how did Jesus die? By stoning? By crucifixion on the wood. He had to hang on the tree. Now, the word tree and the word wood in the Greek are the same word. Therefore, he hanged upon a tree. He hanged upon the wood. It's the same thing. You remember when Jesus was going up Calvary's mountain? They laid the cross on his back. You remember when Isaac was coming up the same mountain centuries earlier? Abraham took the wood and laid it on his back. The wood is a picture of the redemption that Christ paid for us on the tree. Because that's where the sin came from, the tree. And now he's paying for that sin by dying on the tree. That is a picture of of the ransom. The pulpit of wood is the whole foundation of present truth. If there's one doctrine that we would all say that's the foundation doctrine for present truth. Remember the analogy? That's the, the hub from which all the spokes come out in the wheel? That's the doctrine of the ransom. Remember that chapter in volume one, ransom and restitution? What a glowing analysis of the fact that if he died for everyone, then everyone has to benefit. That's the central theme of the truth. 
So Ezra mounts this pulpit of wood. That's the doctrine of the ransom that Brother Russell used as the fulcrum for all of his teaching. And now if you count all the people helping him, you'll see all these names in verse 4. There's Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah. I won't read them all. Thirteen. Okay, that's where we're going. Thank you. Thirteen names. And now you notice that it says they were on his right hand and on his left. And how does it break up? Six on one side and seven on another. What does 13 mean? The ransom because of the six and the seven. It breaks it up exactly the way it's supposed to be broken up to give you the meaning. Now, if you look a little further, you'll find another list of people in verse 7. Jeshua, Bani, Shebnei, Jamin. Now, how many of those names? 13. Even if you didn't count them, you know where I'm going. It's, it's like telling you the, the ransom and the ransom again. You got two 13s. This is all a picture of the harvest, which, by the way, is 13 13s long. You know, I think this number 13 is the ransom and the climax, as it were, also. The 13 years by which Enoch preceded the, the thousand years of Adam, I think is a little picture of the church coming to life at the beginning of the harvest before, finally, 13 times 13 later, we're going to find the end of the curse. Now, that's what I think is happening here in 858. That 13 is a little picture of the harvest. That's what I propose. If that's true, what is 845 a little picture of? Tom, what would you say? Which is from Advent to Advent, how long? From Advent to Advent, 29 to 1874. No, you don't. No, you don't. You just have to get on the track. You don't have to. 29 to... Okay, do the math. 1845. Okay. You all know that number. You just know where, you don't know where I'm going, but you all know the number. 1845. So is this perhaps a little way of saying you take you to the Lord's second advent and then take you 13 times 13 farther, and what date do you get? 2043. So each one of these events points to the end of the harvest. The number itself, is that a little pointer to the end of the age? 169 years after the harvest begins? Okay, now my time is up. And we have yet to talk about this number. So come back. (laughs) Okay.